Well, we're heading to the Mectory. Uh, apparently, it's essentially a space at the university here in town, and it's an incubation uh, slash prototyping space from what we know. I believe we're going to have the chance to meet, based on, on the, uh, the agenda we have, some pretty exciting people. Uh, we've actually got the kind of the, the, uh, the girl that kind of initiated this coding in school piece. We actually engaged her to a Forbes article we'd found and asked to meet her if she's going to be showing up. We've got the formal, uh, the former, I should say, general uh, manager with Skype, Estonia. Uh, he's coming at it from the industry side. What do they want to see for talent? What have they been doing to prepare? Uh, we've got someone from a gaming vertical accelerator uh, for, uh, for essentially uh, electronic gaming. And then a bunch of people working in Mectory, which is uh, this, uh, this incubation, prototyping, tech acceleration space. So pretty exciting stuff. We kind of set this goal from the grassroots. So this is myself and a bunch of others saying, well, why can't we put it back into the school system and completely change the curriculum so that all kids are going to be taught coding in schools? And we said, why can't we do this by next September? Like, why not? Mm -hmm. And so we were like, let's follow the puck as they say in mm -hmm, hockey, mm -hmm. and let's follow the story, let's start capturing information, let's start getting support rallied, let's start following the pilots in the schools, and let's start getting some great examples from around mm -hmm. the world right, right. to say, you know, it's possible because it's being done elsewhere. Uh, we have a huge shortage of uh, IT specialists, uh, same as you. Overall, the industry is about 17,000 people. Uh, and we estimate uh, and we actually focus to get it doubled by year 2020. And uh, this means that we need hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, graduates every year. And uh, the short-term shortage in Estonia right now is about uh, uh, 1,000 to 1,500 people that could be employed right away. Right. Uh, if you give six months lead time, we could probably employ 2,000 over 2,000 people immediately. We've had some, some good successes similar to, you know, not quite at the same level of Skype, but some similar successes yeah. uh, where we've had some startups that have gone, like uh, Q1 Labs was bought by, uh, by uh, IBM for mm -hmm. like 800 million, and then mm -hmm. Radian 6 was bought by Salesforce by for like 250 million and so there's been and nice. there's been a couple other ones uh, one in Halifax was bought for 70 million and so there's been a bunch of those startups which got out, got all the other startup people all like super excited yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. a lot of you know what I mean it's just yes, like with totally. Skype being bought totally. by Microsoft totally. it's like whoa you know we can do yeah. it too yeah and yeah. so there's lots of energy yes and there's lots of like so there's startups and incubators going mm -hmm. like crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. and so but you gotta feed that but you have to feed it right you mm -hmm. need more people yes because yes. the, the startups need people to drive those companies, totally. so it's there. Similarly, like, like yeah, you said, yeah. you got it. You you got the, this this thing going. Where most most people would be like, how do we create that? Well, it's mm -hmm. created. Now, how do you feed it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or before you lose it, right? Yeah. Well, our strategy, of course, has been that we we can't just uh, bring ten thousand more people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there is there hasn't been enough ambitious goals. Uh, right now, we bring about uh, maybe up to thousand people a year with long-term living permits here, which is obviously not enough, you know. We only get maybe 150 of them into IT sector. Uh, Sweden uh, last year bought 3,200 people the long-term living permits uh, in IT sector. Just in the IT sector? Just in the IT sector. Yeah. Fin Finland yeah. said, uh, beginning of this year, they said they, got, they are hoping to get 30,000 uh, knowledge workers into Finland uh, this year, and this of course co goes across different sectors, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, knowledge worker, well, <laughs> IT as well. Yeah. So the, uh, they are, they are, have established uh, ambitious goals, and we should do the same actually. Mm -hmm. um, so who is needed? Uh, ICT sector needs definitely developers, architects, analytics uh, specialists between sectors. Uh, this answer actually came uh, out from uh, latest research about. Uh, uh, need of uh, ICT specialists. Uh, career planning and counseling is very important because we see that career planners actually have a uh, uh, back of social, sh social sciences. Yeah, yeah. So we have to raise their awareness about what's the uh, runners of Estonian economy, mm -hmm. what's the role of ICT in it, mm -hmm. So and give this proper counseling. Uh, we see that uh, even six or seven graders have to have this uh, career planning classes. Uh, because ICT, if you find, is a, is a one of eight uh, key uh, competences in lifelong learning. And 
I say that this is the most important. Yeah. <laughs> you can choose about eight, uh, from eight, but I say I said this is the top one. Uh, just statistical figure that uh, 2015 there is a 95% of occupancies needed uh, some kind of uh, digital skills. Mm -hmm. So what we are talking about. We know that lots of schools start to teach uh, coding or basics of computers in first grade, second grade. Uh, imagine uh, my five-year-old plays Angry Birds at home, yeah. he goes to school and then M's Word, Angry Excel, yeah. Y, yeah. he asked me. <laughs> right. So how do you explain for this? <laughs> It was during the time that uh, that different accelerators started popping up in the world. It was uh, like there were about like four or five accelerators in uh, in the states, and then uh, me and and one of our current angel investors we thought to do the same thing in Estonia. We were uh, three Estonians, and uh, we found ourselves this uh, one guy from the U.S. who has been running an accelerator for many years, but he also ran a game company way back when, and we decided to do a very strict vertical game accelerator. We found, uh, we got the public money, we also got uh, the same amount from the private sector, from investors, we put together an investment fund. And uh, our, um, one of the things that all the foreigners are sort of like uh, uh, amazed about is like, why would the Estonian government pay for something that is not sort of uh, um, directed towards the Estonian startups. So basically the Estonian government is paying to, to, uh, to have this whole thing operate here, but it doesn't uh, give us the requirement of having only Estonian people, which I think is the most perfect thing. Look for startups globally. Actually yesterday was our uh, deadline. And uh, we invest a small amount of money, we take a small amount of equity, and they have to come here. So it's not an option not to come here. Uh, they have to come here, uh, at least a core team. They spend three months here, and they get a lot of, uh, like during one session we have about 60, 70 mentors flying over here, physically present, looking at the products, giving their feedback, doing seminars, doing workshops, different stuff. So we do also feedback from the from all the people that have been here, and uh, Estonia always gets like the highest scores. Like, but but they but they always say that it, it would never ever be a place where you would like voluntarily come to because yeah, it's yeah. not like you know where would you want to go to yeah. hmm, Paris and then Estonia mm -hmm. like yeah. nobody it's says well, it's, yeah. yeah it's a bit undiscovered really it right? is it yeah. is but yeah. when they come here and yeah. and we see that with our mentors as well it sort of like brought Estonia to the map. They all come here and they're all like, this is so cool, I didn't, I didn't even know, like I had no idea you have so much stuff going on and they're really impressed with the whole, with, like, with the whole setup and with the whole, uh, like, with everything that we're doing and then when they find out, find out that the Estonian government is actually supporting it this way, they're all like, what country are you living in? <laughs> it's easy to establish here, it's easy to run the com Estonian company even if you're not living here. And also, it's, it's quite easy to get an extended visa when you already have a company here. And it's so cheap, and it's so close to Finland, and we have a lot of mentors from Finland. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, everybody is asking, like, why Estonia? We don't have any rational experience, like, mm -hmm. explanations, but, uh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you for sharing, because that's, you know, it's, it's nice that you're able to share all this stuff with us. Um, and it's inspiring to see that you guys have done a lot of stuff so it's neat to see completely, you know, yeah. other side of the planet, land in here and to see that same thing. And, and, and kind it's of these, possible. And it's, and it's possible, everything exactly. Everything is possible. Everything is possible. I think that's the one thing that mm -hmm. we've seen all day long, is that mm -hmm. you put your mind to it, you have focus, mm -hmm. and you have leadership, and then everyone kind of all points in the right same direction. That's mm -hmm. the key thing, right? And, and then once it starts to roll, everyone says, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Well, what about exactly. this? And it just do, 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 and then it just keeps going. When there is no direction necessarily, and there's no, there's no passion to go in that direction, that's when, you know, literally you're wasting, mm -hmm. you're wasting opportunities. Mm -hmm. The government had a vision. I still think it comes back to a vision. Yep. I had, they had a vision, so, they, and they painted the vision and they stuck to this is the vision. And it wasn't a two-year vision. Yep. It was a transformative vision. It was a long, and it was kind of like they painted the art of the possible and they said, we can do it. Yeah. We can get there. And the other thing is that in a way, from where they were at, it's kind of like, we have no choice. 
Yeah. We can't stay like, you know, post-Soviet uh, era. They had nothing. They were at, they were like so far behind. It was like, look guys, we can't just kind of like iterate off of this because it's just not gonna, we're never gonna get ahead. We're gonna have to pick a long term, go for the fence, pick some, a, a really bold vision, and we're all gonna have to point in that direction and we're gonna have to go for it. And even though we have no money, we're gonna have to do it and use innovation on how we're gonna build it. Yeah. They have to innovate as much on how, the, how they do it as much as they, what they're gonna do, right? That's the key. And if you think about New Brunswick, and you think about the Maritimes, that's one thing that, you know, I remember certainly from New Brunswick talking about the living lab concept way back in the 80s. Yeah. What, what was it all, in the 90s? What was it? It was all about if we can do it here in a place where you, most places don't, like, it's hard to do, then we can, like. You can scale it. You can scale it. And, you know, so I think we have, Maritimers have typ typically been innovators because they don't, they're not in, the, they're disadvantaged by some, like, the geography, by, you know, access to money, this and that. So they're very creative, very innovative people. But you'll see it tomorrow. I think one of the big pieces I, I'm taking away for the public policy piece is this outsourcing opportunities and, and public policy issues. Because a lot of these are public policy drivers. It's not about outsourcing, you know, the back end of the payroll, right? That's one thing, and we should probably do that anyways. But this is outsourcing public policy issues. Like saying essentially, you know, next year we will have, you know, one common identification piece. Right, that'll essentially, you know, an, an online identity that government will be able to regulate. Yeah. And here's when we want to buy, and here's how much money we can invest, yeah. and go. Yeah. Who's helping us? Yeah. And that's what they've been doing time after time. Yeah. They just on say, all the pieces. That's right. They say we got these pieces. We want to go to the next piece. We're not going to do it. We're going to, but we're going to put. We get, at least we paint the vision of what we yeah. want, and we send it out into the private sector. And by doing that, it it helps. It creates the need, it creates the vacuum yeah. that someone's got to fill. And they put a monetary value on it, and if no one's, someone always steps up, and someone always go, goes for it, right? And I think we've got a lot of great minds too. We've got a great startup sector, we've got UNB, we've got all the other universities in Maritimes for that matter, that, you know, some well, smart folks, it's like, why can't we just, instead of losing them to yes. other places, then put them to, put them to work on stuff mm -hmm. we're cutting big, bold, big, hairy ideas that we need to solve. And the vehicles are interesting. Like, I, when I was listening about the foundation and how it all ties back, like that, that revamping the tech programs and that admission of we've got all these pieces, we're not going to just launch another one. What we're going to do is create this unique brand around it and reinforce all these programs in a very focused manner. And there's opportunity there, even within Atlantic Canada. I don't think it's even just New Brunswick. No. To say, let's look at, you know, let's pull in all these computer programs you know, a DAO, UNB, yeah. Invest in Moncton, and let's just say, let's all act as one on this one, and let's just raise the bar right. all across Atlantic Canada on these. We know these things are the motor, right? And we could do the same thing in engineering, right? Yeah. And kind of have a, a, a focused STEM effort that's driven, you know, not within government, just facilitated by government, and that kind of can play a leading role. You know, we're wondering where's the home for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the pilot projects and the coding and schools piece, you know, and the smart labs that we saw that they have, right? That could have a home, and that it would have an even bigger impact if we said, you know, it might might not be the NBITC, right? It might be something where everybody kind of comes to the table and plays, mm -hmm. and not just in New Brunswick. That's right, right, like right you, across the region. Yeah, you create a foundation that's across, you know, Maritimes or Atlantic Canada. You create a foundation that's focused on working with all of the execution partners, yeah. right? And if it's the various departments of Ed, that's great. And then it's like, you know, how? And I think we're kind of naturally trying to do that now. That's what yes. I mean. Oh, that's, that's what this focus has been. For us, as, as part of this documentary, is really it's Atlantic, or maritime base. Well, that's that's what the first for sure the council. That's what we've tried to encourage: is finding some great ideas and pulling people around those ideas and yeah. just like letting them go at it. Yeah. And then if there's you know if there's government support needed, then you kind of figure out where that spot is. But I think a lot of what we've seen isn't driven. It's driven by government in the sense that there's divisions articulated. Sure. But this is really the space responding and saying you know yeah. you could see like the Skype buy-in into the. Uh, into the revision of the the programs, right? Yeah. It's it's all kind of tied into that entrepreneur-driven approach to solving these issues.